<laughs> Welcome to Video Church. We're in Colossians, and last week we looked at Colossians 2, 1 through 5, and I know that we've wanted to go through Colossians by chapters at night, but one of the things I've learned with dealing with a living God is he's alive. <laughs> and when God speaks, you tend to listen. And unfortunately for some people who are watching, we're not going to go through nightly Colossians by chapters. We're going to take segments or portions, or as we say in Judaism, parshas, a part of the Torah. Or in other words, we're going to look at certain segments and selections that God has inspired that wants us to look at maybe in an intimate way that being taught by the Spirit of God, He has something to say. He has something He wants to make real to us so that it applies for us and that we can learn from it by way of His inspiration telling us what we should do rather than perspiring or trying to make ourselves work through some agenda that we have. Sometimes traditions are good. But sometimes traditions are in the way of allowing God to do what he might say to us. So we're not going to make it through another huge segment part of Colossians, but we are going to go through a portion of it. And the portion we're reading right now begins in Colossians chapter 2. So if you'll turn in Colossians chapter 2 and you'll start with me in verse 5, we'll begin with looking at, oh, let's say... Verse 6, because we've already gone through verse 5, and we've already discovered and uncovered what it was that God wanted for us to learn of being knit together in love with the brethren, and to find how God had so arranged our lives to make us conformable to his will, that he wants us to be one body, one heart, so to speak, one beating heart, that is, that's alive and not dead, but that inside that heart, it would be the Lord living inside of us as a church and a steeple and see and open the door and see all the people. But anyways, we kind of played with that a little bit. But this week, we're going to look at something a little differently. We're going to look at something that maybe you'll realize that everyone in the world has, that you have it and I have it, that we all together in some way participate in this one thing, including God. We have an agenda. We have a purpose or a design that we've decided for ourselves is why, what, and how we do what we do. Some people call those traditions. In modern evangelicalism, or in business world, or in the government, or even in practical realities, most people will call it an agenda. And you have an agenda. You have a certain thing you want to see done, you have a certain way you want it done, and you have a certain will that you want to see accomplished. Your will. And sometimes agendas are good. If we put on the mind of Christ, if we customize our life in such a way that God can use our life in a particular way that he chooses, then our agenda comes into his will. And our agenda becomes his will. And that's what Jesus was like. Jesus was a perfect example of an agenda being completely committed unto God. Every day he sought his Father to learn from and to do what God the Father wanted for him to do. So as you're turning in the book of Colossians, look at chapter 2 and we're going to read from verse 6 all the way down through to, oh, I don't know, probably verse, oh boy. And let's see, where did we say we were going to end at? As the Lord, I was talking to the Lord last night about it, and today, and this morning. And it was kind of interesting, oh, on verse 14. We're going to look through 6, we're going to read verse 6 through 14. So if you'd like to read with me, go ahead and turn to that when we get there. But I wanted to finish that agenda part, because that too is an agenda of mine. I wanted to explain my agenda, and maybe Paul's real fast while you're turning in your Bibles to verses 6 through 14. That... Paul was writing to a church and to the people that were at and assembled together and calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved at Colossae. He had a reason for writing this letter. Now, Paul's reason may not have been the will of God, but God's will overrode Paul's reason for writing, and it became the will of God because God recorded it and makes it real to us by way of his Holy Spirit coming upon us, coming inside us, 
making us and making those connections so that if you've ever been married or in a relationship, sometimes you don't hear the same thing the person is saying. Do you know what I mean? I mean, a husband and a wife usually that have lived a long time together, they kind of learn to tune each other out or tune each other in. Whichever may be appropriate to you, you know what I'm saying. But the point is this, you don't always hear everything being said. Sometimes you only hear what you want to hear, or sometimes you only hear what seems to fit for you. The same thing is true in Bible study. The same thing is true in reading the Word. The same thing is true in being born again. The same thing is true in being a Christian. God gives us ears to hear that we would hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us. So even now, as I could read these words, and you'll read along with me, some portion of it may stick out to you. Some part of it may be highlighted. Some part of it may like look like it went from 10, 10 font to 30 font. Or somehow you may go, whoa, I didn't know that was in there. And you may have never read it before, even though you've read it a hundred times. Those things are what we call the providence of God. It is the providence of God and the will of God to make things obvious to us by his spirit. The providence of God isn't something like some happenstance where you can say that it just was coincidental or coincidental circumstantial evidentiary that comes together in a pragmatic way that the fact of you reading it at a certain point in time and God speaking your circumstances or causing your circumstances to come into coalition with that particular reading that you're doing at that time, well, only God could do that. But since only he could do that, when it does come together like that, you know it's God. That's what it's meant by prophecy or God saying things before they come to pass or saying things that fit perfectly. How could God know at this moment you needed that word? Only God could do that. Man can't. Coincidence can't. Gandhi can't. Your yin and yang can't. You know, the universe doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, the universe works in a very pragmatic way. It's a very practical, very programmable. You can see the consistency with it. But God is able to intervene at any point in time in our life any way he chooses, the way he uses his own spirit to guide us into the same place that he wants us to understand where he's coming from. So his agenda overrides and supersedes our agenda. We could run around here thinking we're doing all these wonderful things, and God in reality has said, hey, I already knew you were going to do that. I saw it ahead of time. I planned it out. Look, over here, follow me. Ooh, you know, and you go over there and you follow God in that particular way and you find yourself blessed. That's why there used to be an expression in the Jesus movement that says, stay under the spout where the blessings come out. In other words, if God is pointing here and you're over here pointing up, you're missing it. But when you're directly under it, you're making a connection. And that's what we want to see with what we're doing today. To make a connection of our agenda with his will. That providentially he might make his agenda our agenda. So let's read in verse 6 through 14 as God inspires us by his word. And as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Jesus. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom you also are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Jesus. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross." Now, that's a lot of theological terms, and that's why tonight we're going to look at them, and it's going to get a little involved, but we're going to try to make it through verses 6 through 14, because quite frankly, right there, when you start talking in, now you're completing him from 10 to 14, and blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, you could stay in that probably for the next 10 years. <laughs> but we're not going to do that. Today, what we want to look at is something very interesting that I find that, I was reading and the Lord spoke to me on was 
that in verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word, that you have inspired us with your will, that you have given us your way, that we should ask you for wisdom. So we're asking. And God, I thank you that you have always said in your word that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who braideth not, but give it to all men liberally. We have a expectation now of receiving wisdom because you said you would do it. Then do it, because you are our God. And because you're God, we trust you to do it. We love you because you love us, not because we first loved you, but because rather you have done everything that we need for salvation. You have provided everything for our sanctification. You have done everything that is required for us to make it to heaven. We often, God, forget to give thanks and praise and live our life according to your word and according to your way. But you've given us grace and mercy today that we could meet that with your blood, Jesus that literally cleanses us from every sin, that has taken care of all of our trespasses and failings, all the times that we have not done what we said we would do, all the times that we have not been who we want to be, all the times that you promised, God, that you would change us, and yet we still fail. Oh God, help us today to hear your word, to walk in your will, and to know your way. For Jesus, we pray to you that you would be with us always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. And so, the Father delights in giving us all we need, because he's a Father. He wants to provide for us everything we have, so that we would give him the glory. He wants to be God and Lord God of all. He wants to so arrange your life and change you, so that you'll see that he has been there all along from the very beginning and he'll be there to the very end. He wants you to know that whether life, whether death, whether the heights above or the depths below, whether the enemy comes busting in your door, whether the friend becomes a foe, whether there be no fruit upon the vine, whether the nation fall behind in its debts or its governance, whether there be a world war or whether there be just right there in your own home's backyard at school, someone shooting people. That whether there be consternation of the nations or whether there be even frustration in your own family or divorce in your own marriages. That whether there be height or whether there be depth of despair when you feel like you have to end your own life. God wants you to know he is there. Because that's what God is. You see, our picture and our image of God, if it's not greater, then we lessen our understanding and comprehension of who he is, what he is, and how he does things. Because he has so given us his word, he wants us to know him personally. He wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to know him passionately. He wants us to see that in Jesus Everything is accomplished. Everything is done. It is finished, as Jesus said. And so when we look to Jesus, we can find everything we need for godliness, for hope, for help, for protection. People often tell me, well, you know, you've got to protect yourself so you go out and buy a gun or you buy life insurance or you get some kind of policy to make yourself feel like you're protected. I just simply say, well, you know, I ask Jesus and he protects me. You know, if I need help, God gives me help. If I need sustenance, God gives me sustenance. If I need protection, God gives me protection. That's the kind of life I want to live. Now, what you choose to do with your life is your own choice. And that's why we want to commit ourselves unto the Lord each day. Because we want to seek, serve, and follow Jesus so that we would claim to be, quote unquote, the word Christian, which meant, Followers of the way. Now, in the early church, that's what the people who followed Jesus were called, because they didn't seek to leave Judaism. They didn't seek to start a new religion. As a matter of fact, there is nothing in the Word of God that says a new religion was started. It didn't say, get rid of Judaism and become Christian. As a matter of fact, the people who were following God were called the followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They weren't called Jews. They weren't called Hebrews. They weren't called, you know, the children of Abraham. 
because those that were religious and trying to set up a religious system, in fact, did call themselves B'nai Abraham, the B'nai Abraham, you know, and, and they were literally like B'nai Barith. They were literally trying to set up a religious institution that would control the people, and Jesus condemned them for it. He says, you don't even know who your father is. You claim to be B'nai Barith or B'nai Abraham, and yet you're B'nai HaSatan. And it was like, what? No, we're not. We know who our father is. And he was slamming them back because they had made a slam on him about not knowing who his father is. And he says, hey, you think it's Joseph, but you have no clue who my father is. Because if you did, you'd repent. And Jesus' father is gone, literally. The son, the father, and the spirit. And they are one. And we're told here, which is interesting, that in this scripture, when we were looking at or reading from verses 9 through 14, that... There's one interesting phrase that you find really amazing because it's impossible to understand. There's no way that you could comprehend it. There's no way that you could believe that it's true, except that it's a fact, Jack. So, unfortunately, you got to deal with it. And it says that, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What? Huh? Wait a minute. So you're telling me that you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all bodily in Jesus? Yeah. That's what it says in verse 9. Deal with it. So, I don't know about you, but I find myself finding things in Scripture that don't make any sense, but I know to do them. I accept them because God did them, God said them, and I know it's true. Because it doesn't make sense, I believe it more than I would if man tries to tell me what to do. And often that's what they do when they try to tell me how to follow, protect, or live my life as a man in this country. There's a new kind of false teaching and false doctrine and false theology out there called American Christianity. It teaches a way of violence. It teaches to swear allegiance to the flag. It teaches to pledge yourself to the Constitution. It reinvents itself into a patriotism that Jesus never said. Jesus was not about saving America. Jesus is about saving Americans and Europeans and Russians and Jews and Chinese and every other nation in the world. All the nations God has placed under his authority because all of the Godhead dwelled bodily in Jesus. In him is the fullness. So, Frankly, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if you want to worry about a President of the United States, why would you worry when you have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over him? Maybe God put the President of the United States in positions of authority for your benefit. So, I find it interesting that we are being warned in verse 8 to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Now, the spoiling in philosophy is something that's interesting that I find right now happening in America. And that's what I want to focus in on is verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Jesus. Because we've already determined that in verse 9, the reason why we should be worried is because in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of God physically. All the fullness of God bodily. All the fullness of God, period. In him is the fullness of God. That means whatever he says goes. There is no contradiction between what Jesus taught and what the Torah said. Or what the Old Testament, as we read it, as Jesus bled it and said it, it is finished. It is accomplished. What is accomplished? The fact of the fulfillment of the scriptures have come about that the fullness of God is bodily dwelt in man, or in a man, the son of man, and that God has taken care of sin forever. That he is made for us, buried in baptism, risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, and raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All your sins are forgiven. And the only way that that could happen is if God was in him. And it says in verse 9, For in him dwelleth the fullness of God bodily. So, the fact of what's happening in America today is that there's this idea of philosophy that wants to make you feel good. You know, I mean, after all, you should have a chicken in every pot. You should have a car in every garage. 
You should have one person working and mom stay at home to take care of the kids. You should have a perfect school, a public education. You should be the number one nation in the world. Isn't that really what Americans are saying today? We have this idea that somehow life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a good thing. No, it's not. That's the philosophy that was propagated at the time of the American Revolution that was going around with Voltaire, going, well, might have been Voltaire's, eh, pretty close to around that time. But there was this thought process that was coming about of what was called the universalism, where the universal idea was to create a utopian society, that a perfect kingdom could be made by man, and that this philosophy that was invested and instigated inside of the Constitution is part of that philosophy that was brought over by the quote-unquote founding nations and the people who assembled themselves together in rebellion to the king that had owned certain colonies that had taken them over by force and instigation of taxes that now these colonies were rebelling against their master and they were using this declaration to itemize, to state for the record what their case was against authority. And the reason they did this is because they knew what the scripture said. They knew what the Bible said. They didn't want us as a nation or us as a people to create this philosophy of the constitutionalism that somehow life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is what God wants for you. God never said that. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. I got a problem here. The three don't mesh. You see, life is given to us by what? Denying ourself. Oh, that could involve the second part. Take up your cross. That means you're dying, so there goes life from the Constitution. Liberty. Oh, wait a minute. I'm being taken up my cross and follow Jesus, so I'm giving up my liberty and pursuit of happiness and life and liberty, wait a minute, I don't want to follow Jesus because I'm having to give up life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have to give up a certain philosophy that I have in America. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Because you see, that's what's in America today. Christendom has gotten carried away because even as Israel was warned, when you come into the land, when I bless you, when I have given you all the things you have desired in your heart, when you have gotten what I have promised you, then don't forget the Lord your God, lest you be turned away and turned aside. And if we talk about the Jesus movement today, then we know where we come from, but do we know what happened to us along the way? There was a time where Christianity itself was fighting over whether women could be working in the job market. Now women are working in the job market, very much so, to, to family incomes. Or whether, you know, the television was a bad thing. Now people are, you know, really fighting about whether or not, you know, having just, you know, digital thumbnails, you know, and getting too carried away about how much they are, you know, texting or talking or not even aware of how much information is going out over these digital solutions. And so... There's this opportunity to take in, take in, take in, take in without ever thinking through what we've done and where we've come from. God has blessed us abundantly with technology. He's blessed us abundantly with knowledge. He's blessed us abundantly with prosperity. When the Jesus movement was around at the time that it was, we were looking for love, peace, and joy, and we were rebelling against the government because we were fighting an ungodly war. Today, people have made war a god, and they're celebrating the servants of that god. Oh yeah, let's go save the world through military means. Let's go in Afghanistan and take away the you know poppy crop, you know, and the other things that are supporting you know all these terrorist organizations. Because after all, we got to protect ourselves. And so, what are we doing instead? We're using terrorist means in order to propagate the same idea of protecting them. We go ahead and use drones, you know, to kill innocent lives. In other words, there's this vicious cycle that goes on and on and on that started from the revolution that we're always committing a revolution somewhere in order to get what we want for other people. That's called the philosophy of man. Manifest destiny is this idea that we can fix ourselves, that somehow we have the opportunity in our own nature, our own intellect, and our own intelligence to come up with the solution. And God says, you can't. 
You can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. And that's why you should beware, lest any man spoil you, because the philosophy in America is that America has a good idea, and we don't. Commercialism is not a good idea. Commercialism is a necessity of dealing with greed in the world. It is a propagation of a worldly system. Sorry, I know you like free enterprise, but it's not free. There's nothing in enterprise that was free, ever. Never has been, never will be. It's slavery, and it's just called free enterprise, because that's the philosophy of free enterprise. To employ you in working for that circumstance with which you are able to get what God said he would provide for you. Now, if you put it that way, it makes perfect sense. If I put it the other way, well, you, if you don't work, you don't eat. Funny, that's not in the weird scriptures, is it? It says in a portion of scripture where people try to use that and take that from that, at some point in time they were arguing about, you know, who should get this portion, who should get that portion. Well, if somebody was able to work, they'd say, well, you know, send them to work. And Paul was using that as an example, not that you don't work, you don't eat, but that they should, you know, work with their own hands, you know, with their own labor, and that they would receive from that labor, even as Jesus said, you reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh. If you sow the spirit, you reap the spirit. So if they worked with their own hands, they would receive back from their own hands the fruit of their labor. And so they would receive from that a certain amount of food. But Provision was always made in the word of God to feed the poor, to feed the needy, to feed those that are helpless, to feed those that are sick, to feed those that are maimed. Perfect religion is this, that they should take care of the widows and the orphans. And we don't. Because the philosophy of men is that man has a better way, a better idea. And in this nation ourselves, Christians, by way of knowing the word of God, started public education. Because it was a Christian education. Started hospitals because it was a Christian hospital. Started public good until we turned away from doing what God said and let man do it instead. And that's why don't let any man spoil you through philosophy because this nation has gone the way of many nations before it. And it's only been around for 200 years and we've done so much so fast, it's obvious we won't last. And that's why we're not in prophecy. We don't amount to much. <laughs> There's not that big an impact, I'm sorry to say, on the annals of history, except that, guess what? They came, they saw, they're gone. The same way that, yeah, there were many people in Nineveh. They were feared of the, the people of Nineveh. You know, I mean, Jonah, thank God that, you know, we had the book of Jonah to record it. Otherwise, you'd have never have heard of those people that were, like, so bad. And Jonah was worried about it. And yet they were gone within a couple generations. By Nineveh today. Not much around, is there? Less than 200 years is what we exist in, and we will not exist 300, nor 250, <laughs> the rate we're going. The Lord will return soon. But here's the point. American philosophy isn't Christian philosophy. Sorry, it's just not. And here's the next part that you should look at when you're looking at verse 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. The biggest reality check that you find in America today is that there's this whole segment of Christians that think that evangelicalism, Protestantism, and all these things are American Christianity, and Christianity has its home in America. They don't consider other nations as being, you know, Christian. Well, you know, they're, they're the third world countries. They're the uh, outlying, you know, fringes of Christianity that once was, but isn't anymore, the center of Christian happenings. And yet, the biggest denomination of Christianity is in Rome. And it will be the biggest failing in some ways at the same time. But knowing this, if we have a warning, should we not do what it says, beware? In other words, beware means to be made aware. It means to be knowledgeable of, examine, not fear of, but to look at and say, well, maybe that's true. And that's what the word beware means. It means to be aware of and to take certain amount of precautions in looking at and examining what's going to be said next. And so when it says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, that is a biggie when you add that vain deceit, because that's pride of life. The pride factor in America is that we supposedly are number one, and we're not. We're supposedly the greatest nation in the world, and we're not. We're supposedly the greatest lifestyle in the world, and we're not. I mean, if, frankly, we export more cults than we do Christians. We do. 
around the world. There is a lot more Christianity being <laughs> looked at as like, excuse me? I thought Jesus said, you know, the poor, you know, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And you're telling me to get rich? You're telling me to have all this money? Well, yeah, I'll take that kind of Christianity. Vain deceit. Or you're telling me that, you know, God wants me to have a wonderful life, that God wants me to have a prosperous life, God wants me to have all these things, to accumulate all the goodies that I can get in the American dream, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, vain deceit. Because all of these things disappear. How fast did they disappear at 9-11? Like that. And everyone was back in church going, oh, oh no. Well, I lived around before 9-11. And I remember before 9-11 how people were getting rich in Christianity. How they were prospered in having, let's flip a house. And that was the number one TV station in America. Flipping properties. And churches, people, pastors, you name it. Everyone was investing, investing, investing in flipping houses and property. And then the bubble burst. And then people were investing in what? The stock market. And the stock market kind of went under a curse. And then people were investing in, and you know the story, 401ks or getting health benefits or one thing after another that turns your security away from trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Leaning not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledging Him. Oh no, we got to invest in our 401k for retirement. We have to get our health care. We have to get our security system. We have to have our security guards. We have to make sure that we have a locked camp at our public schools or we could trust in the Lord with all our heart. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. I wonder what happened to Christianity. After the tradition of men. You know, it's it's kind of scary when you know world history. Uh, I shouldn't say scary. It's actually kind of funny, I think. I, I look at things a little weird. I see things kind of funny. I, I I know world history. I look the Roman Empire, and you look at America, and there's no difference. I mean, you don't have to go on Fox News or CNN or ABC, CBS, NBC, or any news station or uh, RT News or Al Jazeera News, you know, some of the other alternative news newses, to sit down and look at, even from a Christian perspective, what... Maybe Francis Schaeffer warned us, or A.W. Tozer warned us, or even Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer warned us. We are following in the very footsteps of a nation that happened before us. A unified nation, a nation of we the people. A nation that existed as a world power, that controlled commercialism, that instigated a world enterprise that wanted everyone to be part of the free enterprise system of taxation, but also of representation. And that was the Roman Empire. And that's what America is. It is the Roman Empire. We personify it, we exemplify it, and in the spirit of that same empire, we are doing the same through business. We are the Babylonian system, in a sense that we have fulfilled the same thing that the Romans took from previous cultures and employed them in their own culture to adapt and to incorporate. How many times have you heard that in America from give me your tired, your poor, your work, your sick, your healthy, and you know, they come to come to America and be within a generation or two, two or three generations will have incorporated you into our way of life. I dare say we need to be careful about the traditions of men. Because what is being propagated as supposedly a Christian history of supposedly Christian men, of supposedly working through Christianity, is a tradition that's being stated unbelievably without fact and treated as though it were reality. When there are contradictions in what people are saying about the way this nation was started. I find it fascinating that we have a philosophy today that makes us out to be the center or the heartbeat of Christianity. Vain deceit. Traditions of men. Traditions are always those things that want to make you remember old things so that you don't forget where you come from so you know where you're going. And we've begun to change those traditions now in these latter days to make them into something they never were. In the early days of the 
nation's founding, the traditions weren't started as something to be sold to the nation as a commercial endeavor. But it was rather done so that they could make more money from less paying of taxes, so that they could have more business and expansion into the rest of the lands that were still to be occupied that would be conquered in the name of Manifest Destiny. And that's the one thing that people don't talk about much anymore, this Manifest Destiny, this doctrine that was the idea that man is meant to have a destiny and he's meant to accumulate to himself wealth, prosperity, to get more, to be more, and to accomplish more. Have you ever heard that, be all you can be? Do you know that's part of Manifest Destiny? Man elevating himself, man seeking to have more. I want to get more for my kids. And I want to have my own little time off, too. In Christianity, there was a time where, you know, people were so prosperous in this land before 9-11 that they were taking Christian cruises and taking Christian... Oh, wait a minute, they're still doing that. And taking Christian vacation. Oh, they're still doing that. And opening up Christian holy lands or Christian entertainment lands. Oh, they're still doing that. You know, and Christian radio stations and Christian stations and Christian... Oh, they're still doing that. Only they're not quite as prosperous at it as they were the traditions of man. It's scary because if you look at the Roman Catholic Church, it doesn't look much different than, quite frankly, evangelicalism today. The structures, the personifying of the dogmas, the doctrines, it's coming out pretty hardcore. It's getting pretty clear about the separation of what's happening with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Traditions of men. Be very careful what you're doing with your tradition. Because after the rudiments of the world, and not after Jesus, it's what we're warned. So let's reverse that order for a minute. Let's read the scripture itself to start with, to remind ourselves what we're worried about, what we're concerned about, what we're looking at, and what we're wanting to examine and seeing if we're in the faith or we're walking away from the Lord. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, and not or after the tradition of man, and after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now let's put it, let's go after Jesus. Let's take that last two words and put them at the front. After Jesus, lest, beware lest any man spoil you, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Jesus. Interesting, after Jesus, beware lest any man spoil you. Beware lest you be spoiled through philosophy. Beware lest you be spoiled through vain deceit. Beware lest you be spoiled after the tradition of men. Beware lest you be spoiled by the rudiments of the world. What are the rudiments of the world? Isn't it like, you know, you got to find a place to shelter yourself? You have to have a job. You have to earn a living. You have to have something to eat, something to drink, you know, multiply. I find this interesting because the rudiments of the world sounds to me like Genesis where it says, be fruitful and multiply. I've given you, you know, the world. I've given you this. I've given you that. And now go out, be fruitful and multiply. I don't think it said go out and sell. I don't think it said go out and, you know, create a enterprise for making yourself wealthy or, you know, having more free time. Because if you look at technology and technocracy or you look at the Industrial Revolution, we don't have more free time. So the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is kind of an interesting thing. And we don't really have less time in one way because we're all involved in taking care of everything that we have to take care of because of the Industrial Revolution. Don't we have to wash our clothes? Don't we have to fix the toilet? Don't we have to clean the toilet? Don't we have to be about all these things that Martha was worried about? Don't we have to get our job and make sure that we go to our job 40 hours a week so that we can get our kids' education, so that we can get our goodies, our cars, our insurances, provide for our house, provide for our living? I mean, those all sound like a good, worldly, godly vision, don't they? And yet, they are the rudiments of the world. But after Jesus, for in him, dwell of all the fullness of Godhead bodily. Do you think God can take care of you? Really? Do you think you have to go to work today? 
Seriously. Do you think that you will starve to death if you don't go to work? Honestly. Now, maybe if you're in a country like, oh, I don't know, Saudi Arabia or someplace out in the desert where if you don't, you know, actually plant something and reap a harvest, you know, you will starve to death. I still debate that one. I don't think you'd starve. But let's be honest for a moment. How many Christians do you know? How many of the elect do you see begging for bread? How many of the righteous are forsaken? How many of those like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego died in the fire for following Jesus? How many of those do you know like Abraham left everything behind and died doing what God said? How many do you know personally that have lived the life that Jesus said to live and regretted it? And yet, what are you doing about your life? Do you really think God is so small, so picayune, so like man that he has to use your job in order to provide for you? Do you really think that he needs you to be his hands and feet? Do you really think that you have to be the one to provide for your family when God is called Jehovah Jireh, God my provider? Now, I understand that you can think that this is getting too carried away, that you're becoming too, you know, idealistic. Really? Am I? What did Jesus say? Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And what does the world say? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what are you doing today? Which are you doing? Are you denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus? Are you actually giving God a chance to provide for you? Have you ever stopped everything you were doing and waited on the Lord to see if he would come through? I have. I don't tell you to do something I haven't tried. <laughs> as crazy as I was in the early days of the Jesus movement, I'm still just as crazy today. I came to the land I live in right now with no money. As a matter of fact, at the time that God told me to go, God said, I'm sending you, and it was to Utah, but I'm sending you. And I went, okay. And at that church that I was going to at the time, I cried that night and I wept bitterly and I thought, I don't want to give up all the blessings that I have because it was a powerful ministry there that was dynamic in the word of God. They're, they're wonderful. I still recommend them today, you know, um, to study with, you know, to whatever if you can't go there. But it was like, wow, pure word of God. Pure like the Jesus movement. It was like drinking from wellsprings of salvation. Every time. Every time for six months. That's what I got from there. And so that night I cried. The next week, I'm flat on my back in a hospital bed dying. Literally. We're broke. We got no money. We got nothing. And yet, less than six months later, here I am. Oh, six months. I don't know. Yeah, less than six months. Less than six months later, here I am. Here I am. You tell me what you can't do, and I'll tell you what God can do. Because you see, I live my life as a testimony and a witness to Jesus Christ after not the rudiments of the world. Not that any man should spoil me through philosophy. Not that I should be caught up in vain deceit. Not that I should follow the traditions of men. And not should I be in anything except that in Jesus dwells the fullness of God himself. And God has provided for me every step of the way. And I've lived my life according to that way. That will and that person of Jesus himself that can make you live today according to his way. And not your own. Oh sure, if you like your job, go there. If that's what you need to do, go there. If God says go to work, you go to work. Because, you see, that's the difference between what you have done with your commitments and what God has said in his Son. Because the Son showed us the way that we should live our lives every day. We should open up our eyes, reach out to the man upstairs, like Neil Diamond sang this song one time, reach out with a hand to the man upstairs and ask him what he wants you to do today. And do it every day. And watch what happens to your life. It will change in every way. In every area of your life. If you'll get up every morning before anyone's around. Let no one see you. No one know. And no one talk to you. And you get before God alone. And you tell him and ask him what to do. And let him lead you. Your life will change in every area of your life. Every area. And you'll go to heaven. Guaranteed. No matter what you may think or do. Even if you die the next day. You'll be thought a fool because you're following Jesus. You'll be thought a fool because you've given up house or home or family or friends or mothers or daughters or children for the kingdom of God's sake. 
Because you've denied yourself. You've taken up your cross and you follow Jesus. Because you have not let the rudiments of the world, the things of the traditions of men, the philosophy or the vain deceit, carry you away with your own idealism of what you want to be, of your selfish nature, of your flesh. But rather you crucified yourself to live unto Jesus. Would you do that today? Would you really? Because that's what I'm asking you to do now. Even as the Colossians were known for their love, known for their coming together because they were in love with Jesus. They wanted nothing more than to see God and the glory of heaven revealed on earth. Do you want that? You might not. And I'll admit that. There are lots of people that don't want to be that kind of Christian. And Jesus committed himself into challenging them. And I say to everyone in a megachurch, hey, you know what? If you aren't giving it 100%, get out. Quit sitting on your butts in the pews, you know, or sitting in the stadiums when God could use you for so much greater and you could start your own megachurch. You could do your own mega ministry. Or, better yet, God could use you and megasize you. Or megasize what he wants to do with you. Because the reality of a lot of times what's happening in these massive supposed churches is it's all fluff and stuff. There's nothing in there. It's not a great accomplished church. I hate to say it, but every time I see a mega church, I just think of what a failure. What a fallacy. I can look at that and say, you know, it's probably a good 75% of those people might not know the Lord. According to Billy Graham's association statistics and Pew statistics, doesn't mean everybody going to a church in a mega church or a mega enterprise of any type, whether it even, even video, know the Lord or walking with him or doing what he says. As a matter of fact, they may just be hiding in order to be abiding until they can say whether they're not they're saved. Maybe that works for them. But what do you want to do? Do you want to go the extra mile? Do you want to walk with Jesus? Do you want to talk with Jesus? Do you want to know that tomorrow if God said, come up hither, you're gone? Because I'll tell you this, you'll be saved one way or another. If you have called upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You might need to go into great tribulation and you may have to suffer and die in order to be saved. Because God may put that upon you. Because if you can't deny yourself now and follow Jesus, guess what? God will force you to deny yourself and follow Jesus in the tribulation period. Or you will not deny yourself and you will fall away from Jesus and you will go to hell in the great tribulation period. The reality of hell is staring at each and every one of us every day, whether we choose to follow God or we choose to follow man and the traditions of man. What will you do today? Beware, lest any man spoil you, because they will take you for spoil. The enemy is out there like a roaring lion, searching to and fro, his eyes running back and forth, whom he may devour. And do you know what it says about the Lord? The Lord's eyes roam to and fro, searching for the one who's weak, whose dependency is upon him, who isn't self-sufficient, self-righteous, who isn't protecting themselves, having themselves like, oh, well, you know, I don't have to worry about anything. I got it all covered. But rather whose heart is meek and humble and broken before him. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro looking for that person whom he may act strong on their behalf. Can God act strong on your behalf today? Do you want him to? Let's ask God to take something away from us. Let's ask God to do something with us. Let's ask God to change us in a way that we hadn't thought of before. You know, be a Christian. Because, I'll be honest with you, I don't see a lot of Jesus freaks running around. I see a lot of Jesus people, sort of. I see a lot of religious people. I see a lot of Christians, and God bless them. If God is telling you what to do today, then you do what God says to do. But if you're not doing what God says to do, shut up. Stop. Zip it to lip it. Unplug the ears. Take the time right now. Get on your knees. Ask God to lead you. You don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go anywhere but into heaven and you want to take as many with you as you can. So let's get with God's plan. Let's deny ourselves and look at the reality of the people around us that are lost and say, oh God, give me a heart that beats for those, that bleeds for those in the nation that don't know you. That God, I would not hate any man, but I would love every man and that I'm not caught up in American Christianity. I want God's kingdom here on earth that there should be glad tidings of great joy that sprung forth from that nation and from that person and from that humble beginning that went out and influenced the entire universe 
with the salvation that God had provided in Jesus Christ that said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please listen to him. Are you listening? Are you? Jesus said, love your enemies. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Come unto me. I will do it. Give it to me. I will take care of it. Follow me. Deny yourself. Can you? Will you? I hope so. It's not hard. It's very simple. I'm just going to tell you how to do it and you can go out and do it on your own. Get up in the morning. Get away from people. Say, God, lead me. I'm just going to trust whatever it is that you're leading me. I'm, that's you. And God, if I'm not supposed to do what I'm supposed to be doing, then stop it. I give you permission to do everything you want to do in me. Period. Whatever it takes. Are you willing to make that statement? Whatever it takes. Let's go with that. Let's think about that for a minute and let's take that to our grave, okay? Let's you and I make a covenant together. Let's let's challenge each other according to the word of God to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus. After all, that is the word of God. That's what Jesus said. It's what he meant when he told us to do these things I said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and don't do the things I said? Let's do this simple challenge, promise. You know, kind of commitment to each other. You know, kind of like, hey, Let's, let's have a communion of spirit, so to speak. Let's let my heart bear witness with your, or my spirit bear witness with your spirit. Whatever it takes. Okay? Right here. Whatever it takes. Let's ask God. Whatever it takes, Lord. Help me to do it. Okay? Let's keep that promise to each other. Whatever it takes. Let's do our jobs, whatever it takes, in the Lord. Let's serve Jesus with all of our being, whatever it takes. Let's obey, whatever it takes. Let's listen, whatever it takes. Let's hear from God, whatever it takes. So you see, let's change our ways and put aside the traditions of man, put aside the religious jargon. Let's just Dump the chump change, get real for a moment, take the thumb out of our mouth, quit pretending we're Christians, and get honest about you know all of our ministry stuff that we think is really the Lord doing, and it's not, but it's our flesh. It isn't going to last. As a matter of fact, it's going to be burned up the first time that you give it to the Lord. He's going to toast because you did it out of your own flesh. Let's just ask God right now to take us whatever it takes, okay? Father, whatever it takes, in Jesus' name, amen.